all right? So our message is called A Tale of Two Prodigals. It's a familiar story that I believe has the ability to dramatically shift the way that we do life as followers of Jesus. This message is for three kinds of people, those who have ever felt far away from God, those who have ever felt burnt out after years of serving God, and for those who question whether or not God is really good. And to be honest with you, I've been all three of these people at some point in my Christian journey. I remember I was, I was doing the math actually a couple nights ago with my wife, and I've been a Christian for 19 years. That means I've, I've been saved, yeah, over half of my life. Isn't that cool? And I'll tell you this, I still remember, I still remember when I first started serving Jesus. I remember I devoured the Bible. Not literally, because that would be strange, but I had this one-year Bible that I would go through the New Testament, and I, it, the words would just seem to stick in my brain. And I remembered I would just keep, tr- I would ask God, I wonder if he keeps track of how often I think about him, because I just love him so much. And I remember I'd come home after school, and the first thing I would do is I would put on worship music in my room for like an hour, and I would just pray my guts out, and I would go after Jesus, and better is a one day in your course, right? All that stuff. You're like, you're kicking it old school, Pastor Tito. Yeah, that's like when I got saved right there. Shout to the Lord, anybody? Come on, somebody. That's a good one. Classic, right? Classic. And I would, when I would go to school, I would keep this little journal where I would keep track of the people that I would share Jesus with. So I would get on the bus, and I kid you not, I would like scope out the bus and find someone I didn't know, and they were like my next victim, you know what I'm saying? Or, or at lunch, I would, I would get in the lunch line, and I would like stalk somebody, and I'd be like, hey. And, and I would like make small talk throughout the line, and then, hey, do you mind if I sit with you? And I would like tell them about Jesus, and I would just kind of, there was nobody immune. We'll just say it like that. There was nobody off the hook. I think I even witnessed to save people sometimes. Like, it just happened. But to be completely honest with you, all of my 19 years of living for Jesus have not been that way. And if you're anything like me, maybe you started hot for God and and you were so on fire for Jesus. But there came a point in your walk where you were just tired. You were just worn out then this message is for you. We'll be in Luke chapter 15. Feel free to read along. Here's Jesus. He was invited to dinner, and Jesus, much like a high school and young adults pastor, was never one to decline an invitation to a meal. So here he was, and he made some new friends. The scriptures refer to them as tax collectors and sinners. And these were not typically the kind of people that a religious person or a rabbi were known to hang out with. In fact, they were the polar opposite. And so nearby were these other religious leaders. They were Pharisees and people who studied the law. And they made sure to point out to Jesus that those are not the kind of people that a religious person should be hanging out with. They said it this way. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, this is in no way a compliment. In fact, this is an indictment. This is an accusation. This is a group of religious people pointing the finger and basically saying, hey, Jesus, we think you're a hypocrite. You've heard the phrase, birds of a feather flock together. And they're basically saying, Jesus, you have guilt by association. And the religious guys are making a pretty hefty judgment call about Jesus, the kind of person they think he is, based off the kind of company that he keeps. So in typical Jesus fashion, Jesus responds to what they're thinking and what they're saying with three stories. In fact, these stories are what we call parables. And parables were these kinds of stories that usually had a big idea and were used to convey a lesson or send a message. And Jesus starts off. He tells a story about a lost sheep. Then he tells another story about a lost coin. You'll see all that in chapter 15. The sheep wanders off from the fold, so the shepherd leaves behind the 99 other sheep to go find the lost one. And when he finally finds the lost one, he decides to throw a party and celebrate with his friends. And then fast forward to the story of the lost coin. A woman has 10 silver coins. She misplaces one. 
She looks and looks and looks and she can't find it. And finally she finds it. So once she finds it, what does she do? She throws a party. She invites all of her friends. And the moral of the story is throw more parties, right? (laughs) No, but for real. Here's what it's saying. God is actively looking. God is actively seeking to find those who are lost. Those with a past that they're ashamed of. Those who've made some pretty huge mistakes that they wish they had never done. Those who don't think they belong anywhere. And in both stories, when God finds them, he makes a really big deal about it. Not to shame them, but to celebrate them. And at Westover, we call that making new. And it's when someone who is lost finds Jesus, we celebrate. And here's why. Because they're literally going from death, they're literally going from eternal punishment in hell to what we believe is eternal life. They're literally meeting the best person in the universe, a God who's absolutely crazy about them. And because salvation is such a big deal to God, it is such a big deal to us. And then Jesus goes into his third story. It starts off with a pretty bold-faced request from what looks to be a pretty bold-faced young adult. He's the baby of the family. His older brother's always been the responsible one. He probably made all A's in school, probably was studying to be a doctor. Little brother probably heard over and over again, why can't you be more like your big brother? But either way, the younger brother is fed up with the life he's living. And he's ready to go out, chance the rapper style, and live his best life. So he starts with a pretty bold request of his father. He says this, I want my share of your estate now, before you die. And you have to understand in the Jewish context, this was a slap in the face. This is basically the equivalent of him saying, I'm tired of living in your house. I'm tired of your rules and the responsibilities. In the words of a young French woman named Belle from the 1700s, there must be more than this provincial life. (laughs) Sorry, I have two girls. We watch lots of Disney. And this young man continues. And you've got to understand that by asking for his inheritance early, he's basically saying, Father, I could care less whether you live or die. I'm done with your rules, I'm done with you too, so let me have what's mine and I'll be on my way. And to his older brother's shock and disbelief, a heartbroken father, disrespected and disappointed, does exactly what he's asked. You see, this is a scary place, friends. In our lives, when we want something that God doesn't want for us, God will often respond one or two of two ways. God either won't give you what you want. You'll fight and you'll fight for that promotion or that recognition or for that relationship. And no matter what you do, no matter how loud you scream, God won't give it to you. Or this is the scarier option. God will give you what you want. You know you shouldn't. You know God doesn't approve. It goes against everything you've ever been taught. But it tastes so good and it feels so good and it's all you can think about right now. And here's where the younger brother is. He's dreamt about that kind of life. He's pictured it in his head. He already knows where he wants to go. He knows what friends he's going to connect with when he gets there. He knows what drinks he's going to buy. And James, the brother of Jesus, tells a similar story in James chapter 1, verse 14. He says, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us. And they drag us away. And these desires, they give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And the young adult in the story, here's what happens. It says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had. And he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his wealth and property in reckless living. And here he is, finally. He's able to escape all the rules, all the boundaries of his parents. He's finally able to shake himself from the morals, finally able to shake himself from the religious obligations, the don't do this, don't go there, stay away from that, guard your heart, bad company corrupts all good character. You see, he didn't want a Sunday school lesson anymore. He didn't want some fairy tale creator God of his parents telling him what he should and shouldn't do with his life and with his body. 
So he goes and he spends everything. He finds love anywhere and everywhere he can afford it. He drinks anything and everything he could get his hands on. And he indulges in a lifestyle so opposite from everything he knew growing up. And for a while, it felt really good until he spent everything. And with the departure of his last dollar also came the departure of his last friend, his last lover, and the last night that he would be on top of the world. And now he's poor, he's alone, and he no longer has the leisure of lots of free time and financial privilege. So he picks up a job feeding pigs, something that no self-respecting Jew would ever do. Because according to the law, Jews weren't allowed to eat pigs or even touch pigs. And I know that's a culture shock for some of us because we're like, you mean no Baconator at Wendy's? <laughs> Pastor, Pastor, are you saying no pasole at Christmas time? No pork tamales? What is going on here? But at this point, he has gone as low as he could possibly go. He's hit rock bottom. And even the slop that the pigs eat begins to look tempting to him. And then there's this moment when he finally comes to his senses. And he remembers what home used to taste like. He remembers his overbearing older brother and his overprotective and overaffectionate father. The humble mealtimes when he'd sit across the table with people who actually loved him for him. And suddenly home is better than he thought it was. In verse 18, he says this, I'll go home and I'll go to my father and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. And I just want to camp out here just for a second because I think this tends to be us. We wrongly assume that when we've done something wrong, that we're so far gone that we can never ever call God our Father. That He can never be our, that we can never be sons or daughters again because we tell ourselves that we've blown it, we've broken His trust, He doesn't love me anymore, He can never forgive me. But my question to you is who told you that? Where did you get that from? Who was it in your life that misrepresented the character of God to such a degree that you're believing lies? Who was it that told you God was like this when God's like that? And when the son begins making his journey home, he assumes that the bed he used to sleep in won't be his bed anymore. That the seat at the table he used to have has been given to someone else. And he assumes in some regard that he's now homeless because he's going to beg to live on the grounds. And in his eyes, what was home will now only ever be his place of employment. And here's where I think we tend to get stuck. You see, there's this author by the name of Trevor Hudson, and he writes about this in a book called The Cycle of Grace. And in the cycle of grace, he outlines this concept for us as believers. And he says that if we will live within this cycle, we will find our fulfillment and our deepest joy from our relationship with God. And we will not get burned out by all the works and the busyness and the tiredness of just doing that sometimes comes along with our Christianity. And here's what he did. He spent time studying missionaries who had led long, fruitful, and fulfilling careers overseas. And he compared his studies of these missionaries to other missionaries who would go and they would come back disillusioned and exhausted and beaten up and tired. And here's what he found. The first part in this cycle is understanding that we are accepted by God because of what Jesus did for us. And once we give our lives to God, we become sons and daughters. Not because of any hard work we've done, not because of any of our accomplishments, but simply because we've accepted this gift of forgiveness. Unearned, undeserved, free to us, but costly to Jesus. Because his death and his resurrection, listen friends, was the only thing that could make our salvation possible. 
And with this in mind, the prodigal son, regardless of what he's done, regardless of his mistakes, is still a son. His father still loves him. That hasn't changed. It's just he's having trouble accepting it. And the second part of the cycle of grace says that from a place of acceptance, we can now live wholeheartedly out of God's sustaining grace. And I'm sure you've noticed, if you've been a Christian more than 24 hours, life doesn't get easier because you're a Christian. Right? In fact, in some ways it gets more difficult because we don't get the easy way out. Right? We don't cheat on our taxes. We don't lie to others when it's convenient. We don't cut corners. But we draw nearer to God in the midst of these things. And as we draw nearer to him, he becomes our hiding place. He becomes our shelter and the joy of our life. The outward hard that we go through doesn't get to determine how much inward peace we have. In fact, it's vice versa. The more inward peace we have, the more outward hard we can handle. Let me say that again. The more inward peace we have, the more outward hard we can handle. But this peace, this sustaining grace only comes as you spend more and more time with Jesus. In worship, in prayer, reading his word, being part of a life group, doing life with other people. And less time trying to live in your own strength. We call that religion. We call this relationship. Religion does to earn acceptance, but relationship does from acceptance. And for this young man, he can no longer enjoy the relationship of his father because his pride and sin and rebellion was all he could see. And they were keeping him from being close to having a relationship with him. But the third part in the cycle of grace is this. As we live in this sustaining grace, we find our significance, our identities are wrapped up in him, not our works or our accomplishments. Because we're his children, Because we are loved by him. We are significant and we are valuable. And in the cycle of grace, we find our self-worth in relation to our relationship to God. And it's from this place that we begin to achieve and experience fruitfulness. Because we're staying connected to the vine. We will bear fruit. But we have this tendency to get it all backward. And maybe you started that way. You were so in love with Jesus. And and you knew you were accepted and everything you did was to draw closer to him. But somewhere along the line, you drifted from that point. And he used to be your friend and your confidant, but now he's just kind of your boss. And we have this tendency to get it all upside down. And we start with our achievements. And if we do good and we achieve something, we feel significant. And our prayer times feel like they're going great because we're making God proud. But if we don't achieve enough, we feel insignificant because we think he's mad at us. And then as a result, we feel rejected, not accepted. And as a result, we live not out of the cycle of grace, but a cycle of works. And this is what happens when our definition of serving God is just working for him and not getting to know him. It's becoming religious and losing your relationship with him. You remember Mary and Martha. And here we have the prodigal son. He had money. He made a reputation for himself as a big spender. He was on top of the world. But when his supply ran short, his friends ran out. He lost his self-worth and his identity and his sense of significance because he was living in a cycle of works. And he definitely didn't believe his dad accepted him anymore. But friends, God is better than he thought he was. The father had been waiting every day for months, maybe even for years And I just picture that the father would go out and he would just walk as far as he could, looking and searching for his son. And I imagine he'd sketched out that day on the canvas of his mind over and over again. He pictured himself holding his boy in his arms. And no longer was he seeing this rebellious and selfish man who spit in his face, but he was probably picturing his son as a young child. Wide-eyed, full of wonder, full of adventure, but oh, so stubborn. And he pictured himself kissing him on the cheek and hugging his neck. And finally, after searching for so long, probably in the middle of one of those daydreams, verse 20, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him 
and was filled with compassion and he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and began kissing him. Friends, listen, somehow our infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing God has the capability and the ability to keep every planet perfectly in orbit and to keep our sun perfectly, perfectly going in the solar system and our earth perfectly rotating on its axis and the blood flowing through your veins. And at the same time, he shows the capacity and ability to care deeply for every human being that ever was and that ever will be. Friends, he is better than you thought he was. And Jesus closes the story the same way he did the other two. The father finds his kid and he throws a party and he celebrates with his friends, except he adds one thing. The big brother was too bitter, too angry to celebrate with his father. He had been faithful, available, consistent, but while his little brother may have been physically distant, he was emotionally distant. Little brother had been a prodigal physically, but he had been a prodigal emotionally. And here Jesus is answering the Pharisees. The Pharisees had an earlier comment, and they said that he welcomed sinners. And here was Jesus' reply. Do you welcome sinners? Do you eat with them? Jesus is like, yeah, I do. Unashamedly, when a person's lost and now they're found, I will be eating and drinking with them. Yes, when a broken person gets made whole, I will be the one who celebrates and shouts, I will throw a party because my God in heaven is all about making new. And listen, friends, if you're here and you're afraid of coming back to God because you're afraid of what God will think of you, you're afraid of how your friends will look at you and that they'll turn their now nose down at you, listen, that is not who we are and that is not who our Father is. And here's my question to us if you'll Bow your heads and close your eyes all around this room as the prayer team comes up front. My question is, what is the why behind your what? Why do you do what you do? What is your motivation? Are you serving Jesus as someone who was lost but is now found? You were the prodigal. You were running, you were at a distance from him in every sense of the word, but now you're here in person or online and you're ready to be close to him. You're ready to call him father again. You've been running from him, but now with everything in you, you want to run to him. Swallow your pride and admit that where you've been, feeding the pigs, starving for a better life, but you're coming back and you're not looking back because he's better than you remember. Friends, if that's you, if you'll just raise your hand wherever you are, that's me, Pastor Tito. I want to come back to Jesus. I want to come back to Jesus. And here in a moment, we're going to invite you to come forward and just pray with one of our altar workers. And just like the father in the story, they're going to put a, a hand on your shoulder. I promise they won't kiss you on the cheek, but they're going to celebrate with you. And here's my next question. Are you serving here, serving Jesus, just as the big brother? It's been a long time since you've lived in the cycle of grace. You've been stuck instead in a cycle of works. It's been a long time since you've served God out of relationship. You stopped being a Mary a long time ago, and you've been a Martha ever since. You've been trying to impress God with your achievements and fruitfulness, thinking your hard work would bring significance and acceptance in his eyes. And the whole time, God has been looking past your actions, deep into your motives. And right now, he's not asking for your hands, he's asking for your heart. You've been a prodigal too, even though you've been here the whole time. Friends, if that's you, either one of those, right now, we'd invite you as a church, if we could all stand together. And if you raised, if you're ready to respond to what God is doing here, if God is speaking your heart with every head bowed and with every eye closed, if you would join us at the front, and we just want to pray for you. Jesus, Jesus, Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, in Joel chapter 2, verse 13, it says, rend your hearts and not your garments. 
Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Father, in this place, so many of us feel like prodigals. Lord, some of us are the the younger brother. And we've done so much that we're ashamed of and, and we wish wasn't part of our story. But here we are and it is. Father, we come to you humbly and we repent. Father, we ask you to forgive us. We want a second chance. And we're so grateful that your mercies are as new as the rising of the sun. That you don't just give second chances, you give hundredth and thousandth chances. And Father, for others of us in this place, for those of us that we've been a prodigal, but we've been just like the older brother. We've been so lost, even though we were right here the whole time. We've been stuck in a cycle of works. Father, right now, we repent of the why behind the what. We bring our motives before you because you're a God who sees what's on the inside. In fact, you said this to the Pharisees. You're the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So Father, we come before you and we give you the one thing you want more than anything else. It's us. It's us. Father, we trust you. We lean on you. And we're so grateful for what you're doing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, we love you. We're so grateful that you decided to join us tonight. You are officially dismissed.